All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our second webinar in our Land Manager's Toolbox and Workshop series. I'm gonna share my screen with you for a moment um, so that you can see our upcoming events that we have going on. Can you all see my screen? Okay. Yep. All right, so as I said, this is our second webinar in the Land Manager's Toolbox webinar workshop series. Uh, the month of February, we're going to be covering urban conservation. So today we have our speaker, Jay Randolph, that's going to be going over a restoration project at the Ben Buren Golf Course that he's been uh, working on for quite a long time. Uh, and then our next webinar over urban conservation will be on Tuesday, February 15th, and that is still from 6 to 7. It'll be a Zoom webinar. And in that webinar, I will be covering uh, backyard habitat and some things you can do for wildlife if you don't have very much property or if you're like myself and you live in the middle of town. Um, and then I also want to point out that at the end of this month, we will also be having some in-person field tours. Uh, so Jay and myself will be hosting a, a field tour of the Ben Guerin uh, Park here in Fort Smith from 10 to 2 p.m. And that's going to be on Wednesday, February 23rd. And then our biologist in Harrison, Katrina Sims, will also be hosting an urban habitat field tour. That location and time uh, will is uh, to be determined, but that will also be on Wednesday, February 23rd. Um, so to keep updated on these events and to register, just follow us on Facebook at 12 Forever in Arkansas and those events with the links to register for these events will be posted there. Um, again, these webinars are being recorded and will be posted on our Quell Forever in Arkansas YouTube page. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I will let Jay um, take over from there. All right. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, thank um, um, Wells Forever for, for uh, asking me to talk about uh, our, our um, as our prairie restoration work that uh, we've been doing. And again, my name's Jay Randolph. I'm the golf course superintendent at Binger and Golf Course here in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And uh, I'm also the Sebastian County Parks uh, Administrator. And uh, we have other, uh, about 2000 acres of, of parks in our system. And um, um, today I'll be talking a little bit about Thomas Nuttall, an early explorer that came through um, Arkansas and was based here in Fort Smith in 1819. I think he's relevant to these River Valley prairies. Talk a little bit about these River Valley prairies, which Mazar Prairie is one of those that uh, we've been doing a, a restoration on the golf course here at Ben Garen Park, and now we spread out to other areas in Ben Garen Park. I'll talk about the beginnings, that it's a dynamic process and, and things change as, as, as restorations uh, get older. And then kind of going forward, what we're working on uh, in the rest of our parks. And then I'll finish with Lace with Hope. It's just a, a little section there at the end that I like to conclude with that, that talks about great things that are going on here in the state of Arkansas with great agencies like uh, uh, quells forever. So I'll get started with Thomas Nuttall. Again, he was uh, an early explorer, the first botanist uh, in the European scientific tradition that came through Arkansas and Oklahoma. And um, uh, here's Nuttall's complete leaf that, that I'll show a little bit more here in a minute that, uh, that he had discovered actually here in the River Valley. And um, um, he started in Pennsylvania and came through uh, again, to the, the newly opened Fort Smith, it was only a couple of years, and uh, he had a journal uh, that he described his travels that you can still find on Amazon and um, Barnes and Noble, and there's a picture there of, of the cover of it, and uh, it's a great journal. Um, if you like history, if you like plants, if you just like Arkansas, it's, it's great to, to get that, and, and I'll be talking here uh, some of the entries in that journal. And this is in April. On the 29th, I took an agreeable walk into the adjoining prairie, which is about two miles wide and seven miles long. I found it equally undulated with the surrounding woodland and could perceive no reason for the absence of trees except for annual fire. A ridge of considerable elevation divides it in about the center from where the hills of the Poto, Cavanaugh, and Sugarloaf at a distance of about 30 miles 
appear partly enveloped in the mists of the horizon. So this is a surveyor map from 1829 when they the surveyors came through Fort Smith. And you can see I, I, they, a lot of these survey maps in this area, they delineated where prairies were. And in this map, they were dashed lines that you can see I've, I've put in a, um, a thin green line to where the, the prairies were. And in the, the top portion of this map was where Mazard Prairie was. And then the red X is where uh, Ben Garen Park and Ben Garen Golf Course are. And then the surveyors there in the middle, I put those dark diagonal lines, uh, they uh, called that a timber area. And you can see from what we just read of Nadal's um, uh, passage saying that there's this large prairie with this ridge in about the center. You can see from this survey map that we can almost ascertain that these, this is the prairie that he was talking about with this um, in the very middle. And if we take a photograph that I took a couple of years ago on uh, Ben Garen Park looking across to this ridge. Uh, if you take out all these trees, uh, this is my attempt with Photoshop, which I'm sure is pretty lame, but uh, you can get an idea of what uh, Nadal um, and his colleagues at the fort would have seen. Uh, I'm sure back then that that ridge there in the middle would have had a lot less trees on it, probably would have been a savanna, but uh, uh, they would have been coming from looking at the picture to the right, um, and it would have been a, a couple of miles on horseback to get out to this ridge. So it, it's obvious that they went up on top of this. And looking south, you can still see the view over the city uh, in development, but um, um, that maybe would have been something like what he would have seen. The extensive and verdant meadow in every direction appeared picturesquely bounded by woody hills of different degrees of elevation and distance and lacked nothing but human occupation to reclaim it from barren solitude and cast over it an air of rural cheerfulness and abundance. So this is the time of manifest destiny. This is westward expansion after the Louisiana purchase. And he's saying, man, this looks great. This is a uh, tall grass prairie around here. This is Flanagan Prairie over by Charleston. This looks great, but we need people out here. And of course, today, uh, less than 1% of the native prairie ecosystem in North America remains. Um, on Mazard Prairie, this is what we have. Um, there are very high quality virgin uh, Mazard Prairie tracts that are left, a little over 200 acres, and they all have for sale signs on them. And uh, that's one of the reasons that we started our Mazard Prairie restoration work. Uh, back in 2016 is because we knew the rarity of them. And uh, about mid middle part of 2016, um, we reached out to um, the private landowners uh, here around the River Valley that still had virgin remnants of, of prairies and got permission to harvest uh, that local eco ecotype seed from these. And that's what we've used um, from late 2016 on. Now, we got a grant from um, Arkansas Game and Fish, their Acres for Wildlife program in the beginning. And we actually went out with that first, but, but since then um, we, we've used this locally harvested seed um, from these virgin pieces of prairies that still exist right now. But uh, um, every year, you know, a small piece of these will, will be bought by a developer and, and developed out. Uh, I rode to Cedar Prairie here I found Nemostylus natalii, the whole plain in places enlivened with blue-eyed grass and the depressions also grew in Baptisia. So uh, Nuttall's pleat leaf, very special plant that he describes in his journal. What's neat about it is it only blooms once, it only blooms a certain time of year from late May into early June, and it only blooms a certain time of the day in the evening. It usually starts its blooming out around 5.30 and goes till dark and closes back up. So if you're not out in these prairies at a certain time of the day, at a certain time of year, you won't see this plant. And uh, that shows you how much he, when he was in this area, that he was out in our, our prairies, uh, you know, from in the morning, midday, into the evening, really scoping out what was going on in these. Uh, and back in 2017, uh, it was the first time I had seen it. I was out harvesting seed and, um, um, I thought, man, I've got to get this thing on camera. So at the time, my neighbor was a cinematographer and he had told me about this, this 
program that he had been shooting with this really cool time-lapse camera. And so I got the guts to go over there and ask him if I could borrow that to go uh, film a flower for four hours. And shockingly, he said, yeah, no problem. And this is a who uh, tens of thousands of dollar camera. So um, I took it out there and, and recorded it. So this is um, a, a four hour um, recording of, of nut off fleet leaf blooming condensed down to about a minute and a half. So that was a, a very magical moment as that was, uh, I had the film or the camera set up filming that. I was walking around the prairie uh, looking at hundreds of other nut off plate leaves that were blooming out. And sadly, about a month after that, that 30 acre plot of virgin prairie there that I was uh, looking at that on had sold and a developer came in and now it's, it's houses and streets and um, swing sets and all that. So. Um, wonderful. It just goes to show the, the wonderful plants that exist on these prairies, uh, how rare they are, how beautiful they are, uh, and just the adaptation that they have um, is just amazing. And, and we really need to keep as many places as we can uh, around. Now, we saw a sweat bee land on that pollinator. And that evening, uh, as I was filming and walking around, that's what I was seeing. But every year now, since then, uh, during that time of year, I go out with my my camera and uh, my normal camera, not that time lapse camera, and 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 just take pictures um, because I just love this this flower so much. And uh, what I see mainly is katydids and hoverflies that get on these, and uh, they you can see it, it nipped off a little bit of this flower petal there, but they just jump on it, and as you can see here on this one, just go to town. And I hardly see any any bumblebees um, or butterflies on these. Again, mainly katydids, hoverflies. So I was down on the ground, laying on the ground, getting uh, a good picture of this uh, nut off plate leaf that was coming out of bloom. And then all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see something kind of wiggle. And this little katydid jumped on that leaf there. And, and then it was a waiting game. Um, he was just, uh, or she, just decided to relax and, and put back its hind legs and, and just kind of like, I'm, I'm gonna wait here as long as I need to wait here. And, and then about that time, two hoverflies come in and get ready to get on this. And uh, this Katie did jumps down and, and scares um, the, uh, the hoverflies off. And then it starts uh, nibbling away at it there. It looks like uh, a Muppet, but uh, anyway, um, so, real interesting about these katydids and, and hoverflies, but over the last several years, that's been the main uh, pollinator that I see on nut off plate leaf. Uh, and again, it, it, it comes open and it shuts down late in the afternoon. Um, so maybe they're the only ones that are around that time. But anyway, going back to nut off, uh, tremendous that Arkansas has that history with us. You know, back in that time period, 
those explorers maybe went on one expedition or two. Nuttall did this for like 30 years. You know, he retraced uh, some of Lewis and Clark's footsteps, some of the plants that Lewis and Clark had collected, uh, they had in a cache and, and uh, it had gotten flooded. So he went back out and, and recollected for them, uh, went way out west in Oregon and Washington. So uh, just amazing however many years that he did this, uh, 25 or 30 and kept that going. So uh, really cool. Uh, these are some pictures of, of River Valley prairies. Um, you know, uh, a lot of things go in mass. Uh, this is early in the spring with a lot of uh, Indian paintbrush, which on, on some of the prairies around here in the River Valley, we don't see that that much anymore. Um, and then things just go in mass like this uh, uh, yellow false indigo. This, was, this area is on Virgin Mazar Prairie. This plot is about as big as a football field when it starts blooming out in the spring. And you can see this variation there in the very middle. Um, of course, Prairie Blazing Star, if anybody hadn't seen that, you need to get around to some of our natural areas in the state to see those. Um, there's a couple areas in, on Mazar Prairie that Carolina Larkspur go in mass that's just striking. Um, and this is something back in 2016, I was out with the state botanist and we were looking at a virgin piece of Mazar Prairie and we found this. I didn't know what it was, it's, it's Barbara's Buttons. And he told me that that was the first time that day that we were out there in 2016 and it had ever been found on a prairie. And we found it that day and all the other times it's been found on glades uh, up to that point, uh, glades in the Ozarks. So it, it, there's still discoveries to be made even today of, of insects, plants, uh, other things, especially in the soil, that we just don't know what's going on and, and where these areas are. And again, this, this piece of Virgin Mazar Prairie has a for sale sign on it. So again, just another reason why we need to conserve these areas. This is another great area that we, you just have these little niche areas, areas in prairies that, that plants like this wetter environment. Some of them are up on hills or prairie pimples. And then you have areas like this that you just really can't tell what's going on. I'm assuming that this is a, a saline area that probably drains uh, more than the other areas, but you say, okay, there's something different going on here. You can see the grasses in the background. There's no grasses here. You get down closer, you have flame flower, which is the succulent, and then you have nut all sedum. Um, and uh, this is just a little sedum succulent plant that grows in these areas. This is the only place that I've ever seen it. I know there's other areas in the state that have this, but uh, Again, just wonderful adaptations from these plants. This is a, a very rare one that we have in some areas of the uh, River Valley prairies. Uh, I see less and less of it every year as I'm out harvesting seed. Uh, this is Oklahoma grass pink, pink orchid. And it's like finding an Easter egg, not only the coloration of it, but you know, it grows four or six inches high and uh, it, it's just becoming more and more rare. Um, just another reason why we need to preserve these places so we can uh, uh, try to get um, reestablish more of them in other areas. This is a carnivorous plant that we find on the River Valley prairies, uh, uh, dwarf sundew, and it's about the size of a dime, maybe the size of a quarter, and it's, a, uh, like I said, a carnivorous plant, and it, these little spots that look like dew on the leaf are actually a sticky substance that catches these small insects that it consumes and use for energy. And later on in the season, it puts out this, this wonderful flower and just the amount of energy it, it uses to, to shoot up this flower stalk and have this nice flower on top of it. That flower stalk sometimes is three or four inches tall. So um, this is a, a very generalized map of pre-European settlement where the tall grass prairie areas were in the United States. And you can see Illinois, Iowa, Parts of Missouri were almost uh, completely covered. This is Missouri prior to statehood, 15 million acres. Uh, today, um, fewer than 90,000 acres, and um, uh, and that's pretty good the, um, compared to most states. But uh, you can see in the southwest corner there is where most of those prairies are. And this is a picture I took a couple of years ago right across the border in Kansas in the Flint Hills area. And that's the reason a lot of these areas in Kansas into Missouri uh, still exist is is because of what lies underneath. You know, they really can't go in and develop this a lot or um, uh, farm it. So it's 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 either used for grazing or or hay fields. 
And this is a, a map that has all those survey plots that we looked on earlier from the surveyors that's put on a, a map. And you can see in the eastern side of the state, we had the Grand Prairie, which was our largest prairie, which has mainly been converted to agriculture now. Then the prairies in the River Valley, you can see Sebastian County there on the, on the middle uh, far left. Um, those surveys uh, estimate that there is about a third of Sebastian County was tall grass prairie. So uh, quite a bit of Sebastian County uh, where Fort Smith is located, it was um, 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 prairie. And it's estimated just through these surveys that there was a little over 700,000 acres of grasslands, but the surveyors didn't count glades or savannas. So I think that estimate uh, now has been well over a million acres of grassland that once existed in, in the state of Arkansas prior to European settlement. Um, and this is a quote from John Carnell out of the, the book there at the bottom, History of, of All Those Counties there in 1889. So this is 70 years after Nuttall came through and he said, I can see no reason for the absence of trees except for annual fire. And John Carnell was an early educator here in Sebastian County. And he actually had his farm out on Mazar Prairie. And here he's talking about the other prairies in Sebastian County. He says, the other prairies are mostly under a square mile in extent rather than over, though possibly a few years ago, they were much larger for the timber is gradually growing into them from their borders. So 70 years after Nuttall again says, I can see no reason for the absence of trees except for annual fire. We've got settlement going in here. We've taken fire out of the system and trees are starting to encroach and take over these prairies. So it, it's not just development. And if you take again, the, the top portion of, of this survey map where, where Mazar Prairie was and you put it on a Google map, you can see all the development. Now the pink dot over on the right hand side within uh, Mazar Prairie there, that's where Ben Garen Park is. And just south of that uh, pink dot, you see that wooded area that used to be in the prairie. And again, fire's taken out of the system. We don't have the herbivores, the large herbivores like bison anymore. So trees start encroaching and taking over prairie. So development, prairie, agriculture, and again, and that, over 10,000 acres of Mazar Prairie that once existed, only a couple of hundred acres now remain uh, virgin prairie. And, and thank goodness we're, we're getting the seed off that. This is a picture of one of our, our small restoration areas. Uh, this is all that behind that golf green there and that sand trap in the background, all that ridge used to be Bermuda grass that we've taken out and put into natives. And uh, we had a game plan in the beginning on how to do this. And I would highly recommend if you're a, a park system, city park, county park, um, golf course, that you have a map that you can show your stakeholders where these areas are going to be and that you can plan out yourself. And, and that's what we did. We wanted these areas to, to be as, as unfragmented as, as possible, these areas to connect as much as possible. So seed exchange, Wildlife could move through these, um, pollinators could move these, through these areas more easily, but also that we combined some of these larger areas to, to be larger. So grassland birds like bob white quail and others uh, could, could get into these areas. And since 2016, late 2016, when we started this project, we've had estimated from two cubbies to three cubbies every year, bob white quail out there, we have bird watchers that come out and take surveys every year. We continue to get more grassland birds in there. Um, we also have entomologists that come out every year uh, to look at uh, in June and then again in September to look at our uh, butterflies to see if we're getting uh, others in there as well. Now how we did this on the ground, we had that map in the pro shop and we had our pro shop staff uh, that communicated with the golfer and said, hey, we're wanting to put these native areas out there you're gonna see areas that are marked in red dye out on the golf course. And when you see those, that's areas that we're considering putting these natives in. And this is late in the season. You can see some trees in the background that are starting to leave out. So this is sometime in April. Um, but when the Bermuda grass goes dormant, we'll start spraying these areas and we'll spray them every month until the spring. And then uh, we'll communicate with the golfers. And if they say, oh yeah, that area, we hit our golf ball in all the time, then we had it in the wrong spot and we'd have to change some of those areas, but most of them we, we kept intact. Um, so that's the way we did it, that we communicated it, and it worked out very well. 
Uh, this is, is how it began, and this is what that area looks like today. Um, this is another area. This area is about seven acres here, and uh, this was from this past summer taking picture. Now, you can see a lot of grasses out there, and that's something that we've adjusted from early on having, having um, grass seed in with this. Um, new uh, reestablishments, new areas that we have, we have hardly any uh, grass seed in there, if any. It's, it's mainly all forbs. So uh, that's something that's changed over. Uh, we noticed real quick that grasses really will take over these areas, but you have to have some grasses in there. And we want these areas for, for our grassland birds, especially bobwhite quail. So uh, we, we have several areas that do have grasses, um, but, uh, but uh, our, our new plantings that we do, we don't put those uh, grasses in there as much. Um, tall fescue. We take out Bermuda grass and tall fescue. This was the second year on this plot, and we put a burn through there, and you can see the tall fescue. Everything else is dormant, um, hadn't come out yet. This picture is probably early March, and uh, you can see the tall fescue in the background. So it's real easy to go in there and chemically take that uh, tall fescue out, and uh, that's what this area looks like today. Has hardly any tall fescue in it because of the burning. Uh, that we did in the beginning on those plots to uh, to get that tall fescue out there. Uh, this is an area at the end of the season on Bermuda grass and what it looks like and what we're seeding into. Uh, we use fire a lot as a management tool. It's it's our greatest tool in the toolbox that we have. Um, and generally speaking, at the end of the, the first growing season, we'll put fire into it. And we don't burn all our areas every year. We generally burn a third uh, to a half of our areas. We keep a lot of it um, unburned for refugia, uh, for, for insects and wildlife, but uh, burning is a big deal to us. Uh, and it gets cranked up. Um, this is an area that seven acres I was just talking about that's heavy in grass. So when you have, uh, you know, heavy grass area, it's gonna burn pretty good. And in some areas, uh, we wanna burn hard. Um, we've been getting some broom sedge blue stem in, in some of our, our prairie areas. And uh, we've been hammering it. We've been experimenting with burning when it was still green to reduce it. And it's been working. And uh, in fact, we recently worked with Quails Forever and uh, Arkansas Game Fish Commission on doing a um, green burn. It was, I think it was late October, maybe early November, but uh, to help reduce um, our broom sedge blue stem. Other areas, we don't burn as hard. Uh, you can see in this area and most of our areas, uh, we want to keep some stuff unburned. And you can see here, there's, there's some grasses that are left unburned through that picture. And um, we do that because we know we have grassland birds uh, that come through that, that need seed. Uh, we also have um, so many insects. These, all these native plants, uh, grasses and forbs are, are host plants to numerous insects. And we know that they're laying eggs on these and, and maybe you're in there underneath there overwintering as well. So we keep a lot of these areas unburned and how we do that, maybe we burn when it's a higher humidity day. Maybe it's a little bit windier. Maybe it's, it's two or three days behind a rain event instead of 10 to 14 days after a rain event. So that's how we do it. And you can see here, uh, it leaves a lot of things unburned, but it still sometimes burns hot enough to take care of the things that we want to put the herd on, which are, are small sapling trees um, and um, um, invasive species as well. And it, here's the main benefit for us in our restoration uh, doing these burns. It gets us back down to bare ground that we can either seed into for the first time or we intercede in. And it also gives the advantage of um, uh, these plants that are coming out for the second year or uh, initially germinating, that they don't have to compete for sunlight and nutrients on those grasses that remain dormant. And so these, these forbs will get a head start for a month, month and a half before those grasses get big enough um, that uh, they start um, uh, putting an impact on those. Um, and like I said, it also helps with invasive species is, is it doesn't necessarily kill them all the time. Like you see here, these clumps of, uh, of Japanese honeysuckle. But what it does is it, it consumes them during the fire. And then when they, they come back out in the spring, 
it's so much easier for us to put on a backpack sprayer and go through and hit those as they're in bunches. And as you can see, a lot of things are still dormant around it. So collateral damage to the wanted plants um, is, is limited. Um, and calorie pair that you see here in the middle, um, we can hit those with the same herbicide that we're going through and taking these areas out. Uh, so this is something here that we've been trying the last couple of years. This is on a virgin piece of the prairie. Uh, I wish some of our areas looked like that, but this is two hemiparasitic plants. You have wood, wood bentony in the foreground that has the white little flowers on it, and then uh, Indian paintbrush is the orange one in the background. And uh, this this research came out, I think it came out in 2017, but it may have came out in 2018, talking about how hemiparasitic plants may influence uh, prairie quality, diversity, and structure. And they do that by, by putting the hurt if you will, on these grasses that are around it. And you can see in this picture here, this, this wood bentony in the yellow and the grasses that, that uh, are almost in a dormant state as other grasses that wood bentony in or around are, are coming on and are becoming lush. And you can see it a little bit better there with the contrast adjusted. Um, again, um, contrast adjusted, you can see this little circle around it. Now, um, you can see some, some forbs coming in around that, but I'm sure this affects forbs as well, but it definitely affects grasses more. And again, this is something that we're seeing on our local prairies here in the River Valley. So this is, um, we, we uh, harvest seed on wood bentony and Indian paintbrush, and uh, we've been seeding these in. We haven't seen a lot, a lot of wood bentony come in yet, but we have seen um, some of the Indian paintbrush come in. And um, we're anxious to see over time uh, how this affects these areas. Now, when I'm out on these, these prairies that have this, wood, well, you can really see in the foreground, all the wood betony um, um, putting the herd on, on those grasses that are there. And when I come out later in the season, uh, just even a month later, um, you don't see this effect. There's, the grasses are starting to green back up. But initially, again, when a lot of these forbs are coming up, it just puts a, an initial um, stun on these that, that maybe uh, gives some forbs um, um, an advantage. Here's just an area of, of uh, Indian paintbrush that you can see the same effect on. There's not a lot of wood betony, if any, in that uh, picture there. So interesting there. So in, in Ben Garen Park, uh, this park's 1,300 acres. We have lots of roads that run through it. And this is something that we started several years ago that anyone can do, even, even a homeowner uh, of not putting uh, herbicides and different things in their lawn or even keeping a little patch that's, that's uh, um, um, not chemically enhanced of, of uh, having these areas that these spring ephemerals just come up and, and we let these on our roadside. We don't have recreation on our roadsides. You know, if any hiker, bikers or anybody comes through, they're gonna be on the road there. And we leave these areas in there for the pollinators to use. We let these areas go to seed. And then that's when we come in and we mow these for the first time, which is generally late April, the first part of May uh, that we do that. But that's, that's definitely a benefit in our parks. The recreation users love it. They love to see, you know, it's usually this this uh, blue-eyed grass and and buttercups and different things that are coming up in there. Now, this is a picture of a glade, and again, this is in one of our other parks down in Midland. Uh, this is not in Bob Boyer Park, but it's right adjacent to it. A glade, and these are are many grasslands. These these are grasslands on on rocky outcrops that are very thin soil. Uh, now, this is a picture of, of a glade here on, on Bob Boyer Park, and we're working with Quells Forever uh, to get um, a prescribed burn back into this park. It's also an oak um, pine uh, woodland, and uh, uh, working with them uh, to get this back in there. You, uh, there may be some folks uh, listening today that maybe have a uh, piece of property of their own that maybe have something similar and didn't know what it was called. Um, um, on their property here in Arkansas, a glade. And uh, these are many grasslands and, and they are super rare. They hold some of the rarest species of plants that we have in Arkansas and uh, just incredible places. A lot of times you see these, these stunted post oaks uh, that grow um, in these glades as well. You can see some small pine trees 
and eastern red cedars in the background and a lot of other small uh, saplings that are coming up again that, that uh, a prescribed burn will really help these areas open up. Um, so we, we appreciate working with Quells Forever on that. Uh, this is one of our restoration areas that used to be um, tall fescue. Uh, I think this area is in its third year of restoration, so it's come along really nicely. Um, and I'll just go through some pictures here around the golf course. And again, these areas were either tall fescue or Bermuda grass that, uh, that we've taken out. So um, this used to be irrigated. You know, we've taken out the irrigation, fertilized. Uh, in this shot, you can see compass plant, rattlesnake master, pale purple coneflower, prairie blazing star, um, ashy sunflower, many different plants in there. So uh, they're really coming on strong. It's amazing. Um, and the golfers love to see it. That's the thing. You know, we get 30,000 golfers out here. So we have signage. I don't think I have a picture of one of the signage in here that, that talks about we're trying to reestablish uh, to prairies that existed prior to European settlement. You know, 30,000 eyes, you know, look how close this is uh, to the golf green there. And people hear the bobwhite quail in the spring calling out for a mate. We always get those people that come in and say, hey, man, I haven't heard a bobwhite quail call out since I was a kid. You know, who can you put me in touch with to, uh, to do something like this on my property? So that's, that's one of the great things about doing this on golf courses and parks in urban areas is it's so hands-on, you know, um, and uh, um, just great. Uh, we have a lot of photographers that come out and take pictures of the flowers and, and of the um, pollinators that land on these as well. Um, so it's just a beautiful thing. You can see the city in the background. And we keep areas for Bob White Quail. You can see in the background on this, uh, we keep areas that they can escape to, escape cover. And, um, um, you know, we try to put these about as far as you can throw a softball um, apart in our larger areas. And that's, that's generally where we have uh, our Bob White Quail, although they're starting to spread in other areas, which is a beautiful thing. Um, but, um, so this is the last section. This is called Laced with Hope, and this is just things that we're doing here on the golf course, advocating for, for prairie ecosystems, for native plants, for, for wildlife and pollinators. Again, since we're in an urban area and that we have miles of city around us, that, uh, that we can uh, get folks out a lot easier. Uh, so this is our state butterfly, the, the Diana Pritillary. This is a male. Um, we haven't seen any females. We didn't see any. Of the Diana and Fritillary is the first couple of years into our restoration, but the last couple of years we've seen them in June. Um, so that's a positive thing. This is Rattlesnake Master. This is our uh, a prairie obligate. Um, and this is um, the Rattlesnake Master boar moth. And, and this little moth uses the Rattlesnake Master as a host plant. So back in late 2017, maybe 2018, uh, US Fish and Game. Um, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission and others were going through the state seeing if, if uh, this needed to be put on the endangered species list and um, one uh, of the folks from Game and Fish knew that we had some rattlesnake master early in our restoration work and, and, and called and said hey do you care if we come out and take a look and see if we can find this and I said man yes that'd be awesome but there's no way and they came out and they found it and at that time maybe we had 20 acres in restoration, maybe 30. And so it just, it, it, it made me very aware in the beginning that small plots make a difference. Don't think that if you don't have 100 acres or 200 acres or more that it's not gonna make a difference, it makes a difference. Uh, I would say even backyard uh, native plots, one acre plots, it makes a difference. If these animals are around and you have their native host plants out there, there's, they've got it on the radar. They're going to find it, which is a beautiful thing. Um, Bell's Roadside Skipper, again, they've been tracking this um, little guy uh, in the state for several years. And uh, uh, two years ago, we found it in our restoration area. At that time, uh, it was the only place in an urban area that had been found. All the rest of it were out in natural areas or, or WMAs or other areas. So again, uh, small areas make a difference to these animals. Um, this area that we're on here at Ben Garen Park 
was actually the first documented farm in the state of Arkansas that used Bermuda grass as forage in, in 1892. So some slick salesman came up to the farmer here and said, hey, I know you've got prairie out here, but I've got this new technology that's called Bermuda grass and you need to put it in. And of course, now we're trying to take areas of Bermuda grass out and put back in uh, native species uh, to get it back to looking like this, like it once did. Uh, but quails forever, game and fish, uh, U of A extension in our CS, they've been going out the last couple of years. This flyer was from 2019, working with farmers and ranchers, trying to take out tall fescue, trying to take out Bermuda grass and uh, put natives back in. So if, if you're listening to this and you're a farmer or a rancher and are considering that, please reach out to these folks and get that help. Um, the National Bob White Conservation Initiative, they represent, I think, 22 or 23 states. And at the end of the year, uh, they send out this Bob White Almanac, and this is from 2018, and they had an article on what we were doing here at Ben Garen, and um, they put it out there because of, of this information. Now, this is, this is from a survey that the Golf Course Superintendent Association of America um, did in 2015. And it found that the average 18 hole golf course is 150 acres and about 26 of those were being used or could be used for a natural or native areas. And if you put that on a national scale of golf courses, that's almost 600,000 acres that could be being used for conservation, for habitat conservation throughout the United States. And, and people like the National Bob White Conservation Initiative, like Game and Fish here, like Quails Forever, they're starting to understand um, and looking at these other places that maybe haven't looked at in the past, like golf courses, like city parks, like county parks, again, in urban areas. If you're flying a plane, um, not recently, but when we all used to fly in planes, uh, you could see down in, in most of our green spaces that still existed were either golf courses or park in an urban area. So uh, that's a great thing. Many, many golf course superintendents and parks in the state of Arkansas are, are putting natives in, which is great. This is just, again, some of those survey maps. I'll go through this real quick, just to give you an idea of things that already exist. Uh, these are survey maps from Northwest Arkansas. I've got arrows pointing to these and put them on a Google map. You've got Springdale Country Club, uh, a golf course there. Uh, this is, is Razorback, which isn't a golf course anymore. I think a developer had bought this and is developing developing it. I could be wrong, but it needs to be on everybody's radar that if a golf course is there and fails, that that someone else, we need to get other folks in there, hopefully, to buy these and, and turn them back to what they were years and years ago, which were prairie or some other, other natural or native habitat instead of uh, putting more houses or concrete on them. This is a great example here. This is in Rogers. The golf course there is Lost Springs, but you can see Searles Prairie that Arkansas Native Heritage Commission has in the little rectangle there. That's the only virgin native prairie that, that exists in this area right there, uh, except if that golf course decides to do what we've done and go in there and put in natives. Um, this is Stonebridge Meadows right outside of Fayetteville. Again, was on a, a native prairie. You can see city encroaching upon it. Uh, like we have here at Ben Garen Park. So uh, lots of areas like that that we need to uh, do more work with. Uh, so Learn to Burn, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission has had this uh, for some time. I know Quails Forever is starting to do it. And something so cool that we had happen a couple of months ago is we had Quails Forever come out um, and, and Game and Fish. Quails Forever has a program called uh, Women on the Wing. Um, Game and Fish has had a program for the last 27 years called Becoming an Outdoor Woman. So we had a group of ladies, the Becoming an Outdoor Woman, uh, the last several years, they've only been able to have the classroom talk, uh, but we actually got uh, the group of ladies out and, and actually put fire on the ground again. This was a prescribed burn. We were trying to, uh, you can see that things are still green out there. We were trying to uh, um, take out some of that broom sedge blue stem that was still green. So these ladies were putting fire down. It was an awesome time. Um, they were loving it. Um, it. They did a great job. But again, that's where golf courses and parks can play a part of this because the access is so easy. Um, just like you see here with this FFA program, 
Uh, these FFA kids come out in the spring. You can see the golf carts in the background. We can get them out there quick where they don't get bored and show them firsthand that young man over there. He's, he's got his finger touching a sensitive briar, watching those that leaf curl up. So really hands on. Um, we do a lot of tours with many different groups every year. Um, in fact, we're going to have a, a pollinator um, um, uh, program this summer during pollinator week here at Ben Garen that Quell Forever is involved with. Um, we always, you know, get um, great folks out that know their stuff, that are experts on this, that, that can uh, uh, show folks um, how to tell the difference between two different plants or help identify plants. Um, Lori Spencer, uh, Arkansas butterfly lady who wrote this book. She comes out every week during pollinator week. She's been so gracious with her time. She's so knowledgeable and so great with people, especially kids. Uh, we love having her out. Um, this was from this past year, Quells Forever. We also did a butterfly walk with them this past year. Again, the accessibility of golf courses and parks, it's, it's just a no brainer. Um, so easy to get folks out there. Um, we also deal with uh, educators. So Arkansas State, Dr. Emily Bellis, Dr. Jeff Schaefer with U University of Arkansas, Fort Smith, they've having an ongoing study looking at the prairie microbiome. So here we're on a virgin piece of prairie in the river valley taking a soil sample and we're comparing those soil samples to our one, two and three year restoration uh, that we have in the park and seeing the differences in that, those microbiomes. And they get the students involved in taking the samples doing the lab work. They put together these abstract posters that they go to competitions with. Um, Dr. Schaefer and, and Dr. Bellis recently had the research in the Arkansas Academy of Science back in 2020. And that's one of their graphs there. It was on the front page. Uh, Dr. Mike Richardson and his staff and grass, grad students up at the University of Arkansas Horticulture Program, they've been doing native uh, plant research for the last several years and have their uh, young graduate students um, and undergrads as well come, come down and, and, um, and be involved with that. Acres for Wildlife, if you're a uh, private landowner and want to get involved with that, and put some natives on your property, there's the website for them, reach out to them. Arkansas Audubon product, Project, uh, if you already have a property and want to grow some natives out on it, uh, which we've helped with on the past, they, you, you grow these out on your property and um, uh, you can harvest those, sell those. Those come back into the state to help with other restorations. Of course, if, if you're not involved with Arkansas Master Naturalist, you need to be. I'm an Arkansas Master Naturalist myself, a member of that organization. It's a great organization, smart, smart people involved with that. It's a great way to, to get out, harvest seed, uh, put seed out, do stream team, be part of the greenhouse uh, for their native plant cell, just all kinds of beautiful things that are going on there. Uh, here in Sebastian County, our Sebastian County Conservation District, they've been uh, doing some urban uh, native plant uh, projects for the last several years. Uh, that's great that they've been doing that. Uh, there's more and more arts and crafts festivals that, that have native uh, plant themes. Um, like this one that happened at the learning fields out of Fort Chaffee here locally. Uh, of course, Arkansas Native Plant Society, um, they have so many things going on all the time, especially on the ground tours that you can get out and be involved with. Uh, Arkansas uh, Monarch Conservation Partnership, we're a member of this. Uh, their website, so many resources on their website. Um, from A to Z, uh, anything you can think of, check that out if you haven't. Uh, they've also got webinars and things. Um, native gardening, again, put a plot in your backyard if you haven't already. Uh, and this is the place you go. Eric Fusile uh, with Wild Ones, the Ozark group up there. Um, again, their website has so many resources. Eric is unbelievable. He is out there all the time. I don't know how he does it. He does it because he cares and because he's got such a large passion for doing this, but check him out on YouTube. Um, just type in, do a Google search. I guarantee it this weekend, he's leading a tour somewhere. If not, then it's next weekend, but he is all over it. Uh, that's a great resource for folks as well. Uh, University of Arkansas Extension. Um, great resources there. Um, so 
just going through, I'm finishing up here. Uh, again, there are wonderful, wonderful places uh, in the state. Uh, a lot of them on, on, on private property that still hold these, these virgin prairies um, in place. And uh, we just need to preserve these. We all need to work together on how we can do this um, and um, uh, volunteer to harvest seed uh, when those seed events are going on um, in, in certain areas. Again, um, you know, talk to your golf course, talk to your, your park administrator about putting these areas in parks if it's not being used for, for recreation and, and see if it can be. You know, they may already have a plan for something. Um, and, um, and let's get more of these uh, native uh, plants out there, uh, this habitat for all these grassland birds that are imperiled right now and uh, all the, the pollinators that we know the story of. And, and when we're out in these areas, you know, just stand in one spot and absorb it. It's amazing when we just take the time to look like Georgia O'Keeffe wants us to do. And you'll see so many things that you didn't even realize were there. Uh, that's one thing I love doing is just going out in the middle of the prairie and, and being a scarecrow or even just sitting down and, and just absorbing it all. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm going to finish up and, and stop sharing and, and hand it back over to Jessica. And if there's any questions, we'll, we'll get into those uh, now. Okay, thank you so much, Jay, for that great presentation. Uh, really enjoyed that. I always enjoy hearing you talk about the projects you have going on, uh, especially in Fort Smith. That's where I was born and raised, so it's a place that's definitely near and dear to my heart. Um, real quick, I'm just going to share my screen again for those of you. We had a, a maybe a couple of people hop on. Uh, at that last, uh, after we began, um, but just again, this was the first uh, webinar for our urban conservation uh, section of our land managers toolbox webinar workshop series. So uh, two weeks from now on February 15th, uh, I'll be doing a presentation on backyard habitat. So if you're interested in that, um, just follow us on Facebook again, it's Quill Forever in Arkansas and uh, to get the link to register for that event. Also, the field tours we have coming up, uh, there will be registrations uh, on our Facebook for that as well. Um, but moving on, here's uh, Jay's contact information, also my contact information, and Katrina Sims, she's our biologist for more than Northwest Arkansas uh, area. So if y'all have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to Jay or myself um, at any time. Uh, let me pull up the chat box and see if we've had any questions come through. Stop sharing. And it doesn't look like we've had any questions come through. With so few of us, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Hi, I um I just wanted to say thank you so much. I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed this. It's really inspiring to see all this work and this whole series coming together is um uh, it's really good work. And so I um, appreciate it, and I feel like I learned a lot tonight. Well, thank you. Um, um, I appreciate you coming in and and spending your evening with us here. And uh, um, you know, it's it's I I. It's it you know things like this grow on a person and um, it's when it's it's overwhelming in a certain way on the scale that we were doing it um, but um, um, on others like I said and in someone's backyard they can start start as small as they want and and expand out but um, you know seeing things grow it grows on you 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 see that and you're like oh my gosh you start noticing things and then it's all of a sudden it's like okay you know i'm gonna do this and then you do the research and it, it just it, it you're seeing this these things bloom but internally you're blooming as well and it's it's, it's just mm -hmm. it's just a beautiful thing and and thank you for the kind comments there i appreciate it 
I guess I could ask one. And yeah. Um, you mentioned the calorie pair. And I'm working on a campus uh, in Southwestern Ohio, Antioch College Historic Campus. We've got uh, probably about eight acres that used to be a golf course, kind of a driving range thing. It's been sort of reclaimed, um, but then we had uh, over the last three years, uh, probably about 2000 calorie prayer trees have moved in. Wow. And uh, I and a student and uh, our farm manager cut them all back by hand this year. We know they're gonna grow back, but we have a no neonicotinoid policy on campus. So we uh, aren't in a position to use any kind of uh, herbicide on them. Uh -huh. Any recommendations? Um, well, uh, a couple. Um, we use triclopyr on ours, and and that's how we hit them. Uh, if you can, if you put somehow could get some native stuff in there, I, I guess at at some point you could you could put fire back through there. But if if you guys could as well cut those things down, or even bring a brush hog in there and mm -hmm. start brush hogging those areas regularly, that could help as well. But I know. Locally here in Arkansas, the city of Fayetteville uh, recently, uh, the last couple of years, and Jessica, you may um, know more about this, but they basically put a policy that, that they're not going to have those anymore in there. And if you have one and cut it down, they'll bring you out a, another tree to plant in its place. So nice. they really, locally, they've really gotten on the ball on, on promoting this and, and getting that going on out there. Um, where, where I, I would think over time would help some, yeah. Yeah, we, um, I, we didn't want to go with the brush hog because uh, we've got other sort of natives starting to come back. And yeah. so we did it selectively. There's an area we probably definitely will brush hog. If we do brush hog, what month do you think is the right time in terms of, you know, the new I stuff coming up? And yeah, that's, it, it, that's a tough one for us, for instance. That's one reason we don't brush hog because of our quail. Uh, we don't want to go out there, you know, in, in um, June or July uh, when they've got the chicks around and, and go through there and brush hog at that time. So we really don't uh, brush hog. But I would guess, you know, in that case, it would have to be, you know, probably early spring uh, when it was first coming out or on the back end in the fall. Um, and that may be a good time to do it in the fall um to uh you know when everything has kind of gone to seed and and mm -hmm. go through there and whack it to get more of that seed on the ground and and if you come down flush enough it may be an opportunity to to uh you know hay it and get some hay as well or and and then maybe that out i've heard people uh doing some small plots of restoration taking that hay from an area and kind of spreading it out to try to get some of that seed out or something too i have mm -hmm. not tried that so i don't really know how successful that is but well, like I said, this was inspiring. So I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Have a good evening. As well. Yeah, and also I'll add, Jay, you were talking about the native grazing stuff. And we do have one month. The month of May is going to be dedicated to native grazing. So we have some awesome speakers um, for those webinars and hopefully some in-person field tours on some native grazing projects. Um, here in Arkansas. So if you or anybody that you know is interested or has a native grazing operation, um, we're gonna be covering everything from the economics and production side of it to uh, the benefits for wildlife and the establishment and maintenance of, of native grazing pastures. So that one, I'm looking forward to that month. All right, so Rita asked a question. She said, I'm new to Arkansas. Uh, I have bought 15 acres of timber south of Yellville. Uh, I am or was secretary to an Illinois Call Forever chapter, just trying to get involved and learn what is going on in the state. Thanks, I have enjoyed this. Rita, I really appreciate um, your volunteering with Quell Forever. Um, you know, Katrina and myself are biologists for Quell Forever. Uh, we are involved in our chapters here in the state. So thank you, first of all, for being involved. Um, if you are in Yellville, Katrina does cover Marion County. So if you have any questions, um, you know, if you're maybe looking to do some, some native habitat restoration on your property, I highly encourage you to reach out to Katrina. Um, 
and uh, and ask those questions and maybe get her out there uh, for a site visit. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll put my uh, phone number, my email down here in the comments. So that way you can have it if you're interested in reaching out to me. So, and I would be more than uh, happy to help you with anything you're interested in doing for restoration. Give a couple more minutes if anybody else has any questions or comments. <laughs> all right, well, that looks like that is all of the questions that we have. So I'll go ahead and stop the recording. And again, Jay, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this webinar on urban conservation. Again, loved hearing that presentation. And this will be recorded and put on our uh, YouTube channel, Quell Forever in Arkansas YouTube channel. So uh, you can always uh, look it up there if you want to go back and watch it again. Or if you know somebody that might benefit from watching this, you can always send them there to watch it. So thank you all again for joining us. Thank you for having me tonight.